I'm here with Maureen Walker, who's a senior scholar in relational cultural theory. Uh, Maureen, you've written a number of chapters and articles and uh, books. Your most recent book, I have it right here. It's um, When Getting Along Is Not Enough, Reconstructing Race in Our Lives and Relationships. It's an amazing book. I highly recommend it. And we're going to talk specifically about it in a little while. I have to tell you that it's like I have highlighting all over the place. <laughs> um, it's really, it's been a very important book. And I need to say that your work has been very important to me. Um, your thinking and your writing, and I've heard you speak so many times, and you've really influenced how I think about relational cultural theory. Uh, you've helped me um, be a better teacher and think about uh, who I am and how I practice as a teacher. Um, and also to just think about what I try to do in the world. So thank you for that. You really have had a, a huge impact on me. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. It's a part of uh, our, our, our learning journey. And I think we're all on it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So um, just to sort of get us started, I, I wanted to hear, and I feel like I've maybe heard this story before, but I can't really remember it. Um, how did you first encounter RCT? I first encountered it as an intern at the University of Texas in Austin and had these marvelous supervisors, uh, Melba Vasquez, Sally Grenard Moore, and uh, Alice Lawler, who introduced what was then called the Stone Center model. And that's the way a lot of people still think of it. Um, they were role playing uh, some situation with a patient of theirs or uh, who was in an abusive relationship. And this was also during an era when, you know, women were being advised, stand on your own two feet and, you know, you need to, you know, roar, I'm, you know, you're a woman. And when the case was first presented, uh, part of what I expected was some of that jargon. And what I saw was such wonderful tenderness and respect and honoring this woman's need to be in relationship uh, and the importance of relationship in her life. Certainly not saying, yeah, it's okay to be beaten, but <laughs> honoring her and not shaming her. And I honestly believe that that was the first time I saw um, uh, or witnessed any kind of therapeutic interaction in which the patient didn't need to feel shamed. And it was such a non-shaming encounter. It was uh, so respectful that, you know, the movement, as I watched the, pro the, the progress of the therapy over the weeks, the movement just seemed so healing just to watch it. So that was my thought. Uh, then, of course, I started reading everything that I could find called Work in Progress and Maybe the book, uh, Growth and Connection, had been published by that time, but perhaps not. I know that there were just a lot of papers, and I was struck by this notion that the source of most human suffering is chronic disconnection. At the same time, I was reading a lot of critical race theory, or what was then called racial identity theory, and the question that I had then as an intern well, how do we talk about our lives if the source of chronic disconnection is the culture itself? If it's not confined to stuff that happened in your family uh, among a small group of intimates, what if there is an unrelenting um, source of messaging that says you don't belong or you belong only in certain ways and someone else gets to determine how much you actually matter in the world and what you can actually hope for. Uh, and that's the question that has been driving me ever since then. And that's what, 30 years or so ago. Yeah, that's amazing because I didn't know that that, that, that question emerged for you so early. Um, I certainly know you've, you've in, in your work that I've read, you've returned to that question again and again. But I didn't realize that that question was there really almost at the beginning for you. So that's, that's really something. At the very beginning. And that's what, you know, I, I literally moved to Boston. I had an opportunity to work at Harvard Business School. But uh, part of the appeal of that, I mean, a major source of the appeal was that I would be living in Wellesley, like a block from the Stone Center, and would have an opportunity to uh, meet all of these women who were shaping my thinking so much. But I, you've also done some really important writing that is not 
necessarily focused on race, but really looking at power between people and among people. You've written a lot about it in the therapeutic context, and I've heard you speak about it in relation to organizations and leadership. And so I wanted to try to ask you to unpack more of that now um, in this interview. So um, one of the things that you wrote uh, that I think I quoted in my own book is, power is a fundamental energy of everyday living. So say more about that if you would. Yes, yes. I think one of the first things that means is that we don't get to disavow power. We don't get to, you know, uh, to say, oh, I don't have any power. Uh, and um, we don't get to act because there are two ways to do it. We can do it from a position of great structural power and social power, or we can do it from a position of a relatively little uh, structural or social power. However we think about it, uh, I'm, I simply that if we think of power as the energy to induce responsiveness, the energy that allows us to uh, influence other people and to be influenced by other people, uh, I, that's power. And I think it's really what it's really important for us to do that because somehow our notions of power are usually about power over, so they are kind of contaminated notions. And I think people like Irene Stiver and Jean maybe even wrote a few things, a few papers called Women in Power because uh, when they were writing in the 80s, uh, it was not, women were, women were reprimanded, castigated for having any connection or having any desire for either uh, manifesting their power in the world. And I'm acting as if this was like 40 years ago. That's still the case. It hasn't been okay for um, anyone who socially is, you know, in that group called less than, using any of the social markers you want to. Um, the fact that they would manifest power has always been something that someone else had to approve. I often say, if you think about any of the big social movements uh, that had traction, you know, the movements that made change in the world, most of those movements are fronted by people who are told they don't have power. If you have a lot of structural power, why do you want to change anything? And so the change is almost always, obviously with allies, like broad alliances, uh, but it's not surprising to me to see very young people in the forefront of the change movements now. Well, I'm going to come back around to some of this because there's so many sections of your book I want to talk to you about. I want to talk a little bit more about power in, um, I want to think a little bit about power in organizations. And I wondered, um, so when we think about leaders, so people who are in leadership positions, and let's, so first let's talk about positional leadership. So people who are in titled positions. How might the RCT view of power help leaders think about their work? The, uh, the first thing I think about, again, is not to disavow the power that they have. Uh, and instead to think very consciously about how they might want to inhabit the power that they have. How do they want that power to manifest in the organization? I am leery always of... Um, just broad generic statements. Uh, say, you know, we'll see so much writing sometimes about hierarchy and how bad hierarchy is, and that's not necessarily the case. In fact, I think it's not the case at all. Uh, hierarchy is to ensure that things get done in a particular way. I think it's, um, if we look at the etymology, it's, it's more about like right order um, and order, structure, matter. When power goes awry, it's because people are in the position of power to protect the position of power, not to get anything done, not to help other people grow. So if you think about our role, say, even in a, in a classroom as teachers, um, how do we inhabit that power? I uh, taught in a graduate program at one point, um, teaching a course that nobody wanted to take. It wasn't, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to take it. I took it because it was, you know, required. It was... And I was teaching it because, okay, I can teach this. Um, and one of the projects, there were many projects along the way that I thought were fun and creative and whatever. I don't know uh, if they were all that much fun. But the last project, the final paper, was to be written APA style. 
uh, you know, and there's, you know, where do you put this comma and that quotation mark and how do you make this citation? And, uh, you know, what kind of research are you using and how, how are you pulling together everything we've done in this course? And there was a woman who came to all of the classes and she sort of did her thing in the back of the class. And, you know, I was interested, like, oh my goodness, when I get this paper, what will it be? I mean, occasionally she would pipe up and say something really interesting, but most of the time she just seemed to be on her own thing. And so I get, I get to her paper, pull it out, get ready to read it, this APA format paper. It was the longest and most beautifully written prose poem I had ever read. And I went, how does she turn this class into poetry? This is not what I asked her to do. And this is perfect. Now, as the teacher, I had the right I guess, I was entitled, I guess, to say, this is not right and this is not, you don't meet the requirements for this course and just forget that. If the paper had been full of fluff, I probably would have done that because that would have made sense in terms of what the objectives of the course needed to be. But she did this, she clearly grasped what we were doing, added to it, made a wonderful contribution. And my role at that point was to say, this is perfect. <laughs> and to, you know, to go back and say, but 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 where are the side, where is the, you know, I, I don't this footmark, you know, this, this footnote is wrong. That just would have been totally senseless. And to me, that would have been power operating to perpetuate itself. And I think in any context, when power operates to perpetuate itself, that's when the growth, the the relationships that are meant to foster growth, that's when they implode. That's when the mentor-protege relationships implode. It's when the mentor is so fixated on maintaining that hierarchical stance. And I think Gene Miller actually said it best. I'm guessing it's Gene. After a while, you know how it is. We all start talking and nobody knows who said what. I think it was Gene who said, you know, the purpose of structural power is to reduce the differential. And when it operates not to reduce the differ differential, but to hold it in place, to hold the inequality in place, now you have toxic power or you have a power over relationship. And when I want to be really silly about it, I sometimes say, if I board a plane, if we ever do again post pandemic, uh, <laughs> when, I, when I board a plane, I'm not at all interested in democratic process. I really want the person who has the authority and the skills and the expertise uh, to, I want them to use that. But their job is not to keep me in the air. Their job is to get me safely landed and reduce that differential. Yeah, that, that resonates with how I think about it in teaching. I talk a lot about, um, I think particularly those of us who teach adult students can sometimes, I, I've heard some people say, you know, if you're teaching adult students, it's really, um, it's really a collective learning experience and we're all adults here. And so there's really no power differential. And, and I don't believe that's true. I mean, I do work to reduce the power differential in teaching with things like being transparent in my decision-making and my course design and all of that. And, um, and asking for feedback and listening to that feedback and um, admitting when I've screwed up and all of that. But I also think it's really important for anyone in a leadership position to be aware of the power they do have. And so for me to say to students, like we're all equal here would not be fair if I'm grading their work. There's, there's inherent power in that. And I also have a different responsibility in the learning space than they do. Um, and I need to own that and, and work from that place. So I think that sort of aligns with, with some of the ways that you're talking about it. I think it absolutely does. I, I think to do other than that is an abuse of power. Yeah. And I think in organizations, we've seen so-called flat organizations that have a hidden hierarchy. And there's a lack of clarity and people stumble into each other and collide and there's role confusion. And it usually uh, contaminates any conflict or suppresses conflict until everything uh, implodes or explodes. So I think it's very important to be clear about power. Yeah, and I think that another ethical piece that I'm hearing in what you're saying is that if, um, if I pretend there's no power differential and if I say that, whether I'm a teacher in a classroom or a manager in an organization, 
I'm now asking all of the students or all of the employees to act as if there's no power differential, but they know there is one. So it's putting yes. them in an untenable position uh, that again is, I think, an unethical place to work from. Right, because if they start to act as if there's no differential, they'll probably be swiftly reprimanded or put back in the place that's in the mind of the person who's holding or the per persons holding the hidden power. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wondered if you, um, I guess something else I'm thinking about is that I think that anyone who moves into a leadership position has been inundated with the power over message and the, um, you know, grab more power message and so on. I wonder, how do you think we can start to undo some of the ways we've been programmed about power? It has to be done very, very intentionally. And I don't know what would spark that intention uh, because almost as, as you're inundated with it, almost in every field, like you have got to maintain control. And I think one way to start monitoring ourselves is to think about um, the degree to which we're willing to be influenced by other people. Um, because in many, many cases, I'd say just culturally, uh, being influenced by someone else is interpreted as a sign of weakness. Uh, so if we are to be intentional, I think that's one of the first things we have to do is think, okay, how flexible am I? Why am I holding on to this particular, you know, brand of power that I think is my entitlement and mine alone? Because we don't you always know where they are. We often aren't aware of uh, being attached to it, uh, to some kind of power, until it gets challenged in some way. And um, I think when we are in a position to have to think about it, and then really get clear about how am I holding on, for what purpose am I holding on, um, and then it's, I, I, to do so without support is also difficult because there will also always be those people who will challenge uh, your doing power in a different way. Um, I was thinking a lot of when we think about our cultural icons and what gets popular on television, as if I know, I don't think I really know right now, but um, often they are people who are impermeable they go their own way. You know, even the ones that are supposed to be a little more, quote, progressive, the protagonist is usually someone that people can't control. Uh, there's usually a beleaguered boss who's going, oh my God, there she goes again. Okay, she's gonna ultimately be right. And oh, I'm pulling my hair out. But the whole premise is this person is a hero because she goes her own way. She does it her way. And so that is sort of just inbred, I think, in the culture. Mm -hmm. And there's no real way to get around that without being very intentional. Even the ways that we think about, and I know I mentioned this in the book, uh, but um, when we were introduced in graduate school to this notion of empathy, I mean, the icon of empathy was, you know, the great Carl Rogers. And, you know, to just have this, be able to, quote, bestow this unconditional positive regard for someone, it, again, it looked like um, something that he was doing to someone. Uh, it was all about him maintaining, and I'm not saying, I'm certainly not trying to say this is what's in his head, but the way it is imparted to those of us who are taught okay, now you're going into a healing profession. It was still all about maintaining your power. Look at how he maintains the therapeutic frame and it comes out as something called empathy. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, and it also makes me think back to your earlier example um, with, the, with the student who turned in the, the poetry at the end of the course. And you know that was like a decision moment for you and you could have, mm -hmm. and so I think part of it is maybe recognizing those moments too. And I'm also thinking that maybe there's, um, like when I think about it in my own teaching life, um, if I feel myself get a little revved up about student work, that might be something to notice in terms of 
uh, a fork in the road about, and, and all, you know, sometimes I'm frustrated with student work and it's, it's legit, like the student really didn't do the work and I need to then try to, you know, engage with that student and try to help them along. But, but some of the time it might be about like, they didn't do it the way I wanted them to do it or something. And so I need to rec then, then take that apart. So was my intention the only way to do it or if they proved their learning in some other way and then being open to that. And I think your other point about needing support in that, because I can't imagine, I mean, not in my current department, but I can imagine in some places that if you, um, you know, passed a student who wrote a, a poem for her final project and that got sort of right. out, your department head or colleagues, you know, might've been, especially if you were like in a business school or something, they might've been yeah. like, what is going on in your class, right? So, right, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'd like to um, I'd like to move a little bit more directly into the book now. So I'm going to move on. Um, I'm going to read some things back to you now and ask you to respond. <laughs> I hope I recognize them. <laughs> I've had that experience when talking about them. Did I say that? <laughs> so um, on page 32, you note um, until we reckon with the experience of power and powerlessness as a defining agent in our identity narratives, the problems, quote problems, of diversity will remain unchanged. So until we reckon with the experience of power and powerlessness as a defining agent in our identity narratives, the problems, quote problems, of diversity will remain unchanged. Would you say more about that? Yes. Um, diversity is such a cute word. Um, and it is so Sesame Street in some ways. Uh, and our problems in this country are not, have never really been about diversity. The, from the very beginning, it's all about stratification. Mm -hmm. It was all about saying who shall have what and what measure and once they get it, what can they do with it? Uh, that's not about diversity. Diversity is like Elmo and Abby, good Abby or whatever, you know, saying, okay, you have spots and I have fur in my, you know, I am blue and you are, you have stripes and, you know, that's diversity. That's like Crayola stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, that is not where we are stuck. It's never been where we are stuck. We've always, from the beginning, uh, been in this place of who deserves to be free? What do I deserve? Um, who should be uh, serving me? What kind of respect am I supposed to have simply because of my identity? How do I bolster that so that how do I protect my identity by making sure there's enough division among these other folks? Mm -hmm. So in terms of race, it's always been about um, white supremacy, white superiority, black inferiority. And if we think about folks who were already here, uh, people who were trafficked here, people who immigrated here and continue to immigrate here, uh, people who were born here, People continue to try and figure out where they are on, you know, in that polarity, on that continuum. Mm -hmm. And I think Karen Brodkin did some really wonderful work on this when she talked about the levels of whiteness. And I think it's uh, David Rodiger, I believe, who did uh, a lot of work on the possessive investment in whiteness. Uh, there was a case in 1920 where a Japanese person um, I think the case got to the Supreme Court, and I don't, I don't remember the particulars of it, but he was petitioning to be classified as white mm -hmm. because there's real power with that. There's real access to resources. And he said, look, my skin is whiter than a lot of these other people. You know, so I should be a white person. And the Supreme Court, I think in probably about 1920, 22, said, no, 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 no. You can only be white if you're from the Caucasus region. And, you know, I don't even know that that many people were, <laughs> were here from that region. And there, there may have even been immigration blocks against them. But that's how the Supreme Court decided it. And more recently, I don't, you may have heard about a young man. I don't know. I can't remember where he is. But it's an ongoing case. Uh, he's a young offender. I don't remember the crime. I think there was one prior misdemeanor that he'd been convicted of, but his first um, uh, motion to the court before the trial began, this is a young African-American teenager, mm -hmm. his first motion to the court uh, is to be tried as a white teenager. 
because and and if not as a white adolescent then try me as a white man if you're going to try me as an adult try me as a white man uh because we have the data all of the data point to you know what happens uh with the disparities in uh just the in the adjudication of justice and and sentencing and all of that based on nothing but race entirely on race so um I'm, how did this question start <laughs> Over, um until we reckon with the experience or no um oh, diversity yeah. Okay. And uh, and I was you know yeah. a base go at you all you know me really well I start riffing on <laughs> these on topics but I you know we'll wrap it up by saying we're talking about stratification that appears in every function in every place um, every venue of our functioning and being your work sort of sits in this um, intersection of of identity and race in particular social construction and then power from an RCT perspective. Um, and then the social stratification that you're talking about. It just, I think your work really sits in a, again, in the intersection of these areas in a way that's just incredibly powerful because I think when I read your stuff, you talk about, you know, you provide us with that bigger picture and the historical picture. And then you also, and we'll get to this in a few minutes, you also get down to like, what does this mean between people? So I have to tell you, chapter nine for me was incredibly important. Um, the chapter is called Say It Isn't So and Other Race Card Games. Um, and in this chapter, you, I want to set this up because I want to give context to my uh, question here. In that chapter, you describe various ways that language is used to silence and shame black people, other people of color, and white allies in particular. And I think, I think what you're saying in that chapter is relevant if we talk about any minoritized identity, but you're, you're dealing Absolutely. explicitly with race. But, um, but again, here for me, like, so there's, you know, you've set up a lot of historic and cultural context as you move through the book. And then this chapter for me is where you really it's like where the rubber meets the road and I really can see like, so this is what's playing out on the individual interpersonal level. So, so the chapter is called Say It Isn't So and Other Race Card Games. And in this chapter, you describe various ways that language is used to silence and shame black people, other people of color and white allies. And again, I think this would be relevant to any minoritized people. Um, this chapter feels so important um, and I think one reason is that you really show how language and how individual interactions contribute to maintaining racist um, and other oppressive and controlling systems of oppression. You talk about the race card, um, you talk about hyper individualism, which we've touched on in this conversation, you talk about racial in uh, innocence, um, silencing ta tactics, and so on. And I would love to ask you about each of these, but we won't have time for that. But what I wanted to ask you is can you? Tell us more about how you came to develop your thinking about this sort of larger theme of the way that language is used to shame, silence, and control. Um, I think all of us have lived it. Uh, we find ourselves like, um, let me go back to Jean Baker Miller. Jean Baker Miller said that in the, um, the first experience after a violence, a violation of any kind, is to disconnect from the self. And so, or, or what we call self, our own in, inner experience. And I think the way we feel this is when we want to voice something, or if we dare to voice something, someone will come back. Uh, oftentimes we don't, because we've already anticipated how we will be silenced. So, for instance, if uh, I say, you know, I can't believe that this person treated me in this way or, or said this to me, and I'm, and I'm thinking very much about the color of my skin, I'm thinking very much about there's no way, uh, even people who say they're colorblind, there's no way you can not notice who I am. And I say, and I think it was about race, and someone says, I don't know, sometimes, you know, it isn't about race. But sometimes the first thing you will hear is, oh no, that's not it. You know, that it could have been something else. You are being too sensitive. Uh, it could have been. And so, and, and we see how much shame there is and anxiety there is around race in this culture because there's a rush to say it's anything but race. It's like, okay, you, what is that about? Mm -hmm. And I actually think that we all have an obligation to, to know when we are being silenced and the way the silencing happens and if we just take it out and put it into any let's just put it in an organizational context uh, context um 
one of the mind games, one of the silencing games people can play is when someone in power says, well, this isn't business. This isn't personal. This is just business. It's like, well, who, who's doing the business? And who's benefiting from it? And how are these people feeling? Or they will say, well, they're, you know, you shouldn't be emotional. It's like, no, it's just the emotions that I'm feeling are getting named. You're having emotions. And sometimes they're about fear and holding on to your dominance. Sometimes it's about anger. Sometimes it's about, it can be, dis, it can be, dis, it can be all kinds of things. But these things don't get to be named. And I think that in order for us to keep evolving, that we really have to notice how these games are played. And it is interesting that when people talk about the race card, it's associated with um, black indigenous people of color. You know, no one talks about, you know, white people playing, quote, the race card. And, you know, so how come it is that we don't have to talk about that? You know, um, they never have to say, I'm doing this because I'm white. It can happen because they are white. They can get, you know, things can happen that way, uh, but it never has to be named. So the power of living in the privilege of not naming and then having someone else name your experience for you is something that I think we do have to be pretty vigilant about. Mm -hmm. uh, and when vigilant is not the same as, as rigid, it, but it is attentive and aware. How am I being silenced? Which part of myself am I holding back? Which joke do I have to pretend that I like in order I can, in order to be deemed as, um, I don't know, just a person that's easy to get along with? How much do I have to smile in order not to look like the angry black woman or the angry black male? Mm -hmm. So I, I, those, I think all of those are silencing tactics and it's just immensely important to how we get along with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the way that you really break down a name several of those silencing strategies is very important. Um, I wonder what would you say would be the sort of, um, I mean, what are the sort of first signs that you maybe notice in yourself when you're, when you're being, when someone's trying to silence you? I'm sort of trying to help us think about how can we more quickly recognize when that's happening and name it? Um, because then maybe we can sort of see it, you know, from a broader perspective and not sort of just get stuck in that moment. When I find myself, well, um, having this reaction of, if I say this, that's one of the ways that I do. Uh, and, you know, I don't always choose to say, because it's like, I get to choose which hill I'm going up, you know? So I don't always choose to, but when I find myself, or what, uh, when I see that someone is like dedicated to coming up with another explanation. Now, truly, sometimes my first explanation isn't right. Sometimes, you know, people have heard me talk about, you know, being really, really, head up and just just really revved up because I was in a vacation spot and I met an elderly white woman who asked me if I lived in the area because she she was literally affronted by my presence. And I was so angry all day long and I fed that, angry, that anger all day long because I didn't think I responded effectively. I think I answered her question and I was mad at myself because I didn't do it right and blah, blah, blah. And later on in the day, I went into a store and there was an elderly white man there who said, hey, how are you? Do you live around here? And I was loaded for bear. I was like, okay, here's another white person asking me for my slave pass and he, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm unloading on him right now. Well, I got ready to do that and I said, tell me where you live first. And he said, oh, my name is, this is my store. And I'm just wanting to greet people and let them and welcome them in. I went, oh, oh gosh. <laughs> so I'm, I'm certainly not saying that the first interpretation, the one that we feel, the one that triggers our stories that we carry, uh, that that's always the right interpretation. Because again, I'm saying this is all about mutuality and being influenced by the present moment. Um, but when I find someone who is insistent on um, imposing another interpretation on my experience, then I know that this person is very uncomfortable with what I'm saying and it has more to do with them than about me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think it's worth the conversation. Sometimes 
I will, I, you know, when the, the image that I'll just raise up right now is the image of young people. I don't even remember, I don't remember what color they were. They were somewhere uh, walking around with signs that say Black Lives Matter. They were teenagers, they were young girls. And there was this big, beefy, tattooed, you know, hypermuscular guy, like screaming expletive, expletives at them. And, you know, telling them, you know, where they needed to go and all of that. You've seen the, you've, you've seen the picture. That's not a person I talked to. And I would not talk to that person. He, this person really is saying, you know, I don't like this. You're really, he's feeling really antagonized by it. But I'm also seeing that as a person who's coming totally out of his amygdala. I'm seeing that as a person who is addicted to an image that he cannot let go of. And I often liken it to trying to have a conversation with someone who's like raging drunk. Mm -hmm. Those conversations don't go well. Mm -hmm. And I don't advise anybody to go into them. If you've ever tried to do that, you know that you don't talk to a chemical uh, in the same way you talk to someone who has access to cognition. So when, um, if I see someone and I say, okay, there's an addiction happening here. This person is truly addicted to identity and they've got to have that no matter what. They think that is why they matter in the world. There may be someone, it may be someone's portion or calling to have those conversations or be with them, or be with them on that journey. It's not mine. Mm -hmm. And I'm really clear about what I can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. So those are the times when I go, okay, this is what's happening for me. This is when I have to respect what's emerging. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That's really, that's really helpful. I want to just move along because of time. Um, so I feel like a, a part of what you do in the book is you help us think about understanding those kinds of moments and you help us think about, um, so, in my case as a white person, I learn a lot from you in terms of recognizing my own positioning and my own assumptions. Um, and then there's another piece of the book where I think you're really trying to help us think about how do we, and you sort of got to this a little bit there, but how do we engage with people whose belief system seems to be fundamentally different from our own? Um, and again, your focus is on race. So if I'm engaged with someone who I think is saying incredibly racist things and I want to engage, I do want to, let's say, I do want to engage in that conversation. Um, actually, as I'm thinking about it now, you're saying if, if someone's incredibly racist, maybe I don't want to engage in that conversation because they're <laughs> too tied into it. But let's say I encounter something a little more subtle where someone is saying something that I think is racist and I'm in that moment of thinking, you know, I'm ready to write them off and I'm ready to say like, I can't be with this person. I can't engage with them in this social situation or whatever. And you provide some tools, I think, to help us think about those moments. And you talk about, again, several, um, you, you sort of offer several perspectives, but for the sake of time, I wanted to focus on two. So you talk about respect and compassion. So as we meet people who are different from us, bringing respect and compassion into those interactions. So again, because I love the way you write, I wanna read two quotes to you one at a time and ask you to respond. So you say, respect is an invitation to otherness. It removes the constraints of sameness. Simply put, we don't have to identify with, agree with, or be attracted to another person in order to develop an empathic relationship. Respect signals curiosity, a tell me more stance that facilitates a loosening of the armor we carry to help us feel safe in a racialized conflict. As the attitudinal stance of disruptive empathy, respect creates conditions that allow all participants in the relationship an opportunity to grow. And I, I thought that was an amazing passage. And again, it's sort of like something you were talking about earlier. I think the more, um, the more conventional um, definition of respect that I hear and that I think of is like respect is something you give to the other person. It's something you show to the other person. And in this, in your explanation of respect, it's very much an interactional process, right? So would you, would you say more about that? Yeah, um, when we think about conflict, the first thing we think about is bracing. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, we, we tighten, we harden physically, our musculature. And so one of the things that's, that's incredibly important and I keep trying to learn is how to soften, mm -hmm. how to breathe, how to go into an interaction knowing that 
what I see isn't all there is. In fact, all there is, most of what's all there is is stuff I can't see. And so if the context feels safe to go there, if I, you, then those are the kinds of people, that's when I think it's time to talk or maybe we will, can allow ourselves to talk. Maybe not in that moment. I mean, some of the most powerful examples I know about are people who went back later to have a conversation because if we get too triggered, if someone just says a word that's like, oh, you know, we might need to take a beat uh, before we come back and try to have a conversation. When we have that conversation though, we need to come in with what is my expectation? What is my hope? What can I do to bring my best self to this interaction to see what will emerge? What may emerge is, yeah, you need to leave this alone. <laughs> and, and, or what may emerge is, again, you start to share more and more bits of humanity. And I like to say that there are people who, you know, will come across as rabidly racist. And I don't think they are beyond the pale. I look at what I bring at this point in my life and say, you know, it's probably not my job to walk a journey with them or to wait or to be with them as they sort of, um, they actually may be very amenable to change if approached uh, in a way that is non-shaming. If someone is, you know, I mean, we have so many stories of how that happens, how people who are so different from each other. I mean, they Disneyfied the relationship in the movie, The Best of Enemies, but that's an incredible story of, you know, one woman, um, black, uh, uh, Southern housing, public housing activist, and a person whose dream in life, who achieved his life dream when he was initiated into the Klan, and they developed a relationship like siblings over time. I certainly believe that there is nothing that the human spirit can't make happen. I think we just need to know what we are able to do when we are able to do it. And I think it's respecting ourselves too. What are my limits? What can I do at this time? What do I you know, want to do? What are my hopes? Um, I think there's a group that I may mention in the book. I don't know if I do or not, but um, there's a group in, that worked in the Boston area. Actually, they work internationally. They are now called Essential Partners. But uh, they always created, their job was to create public dialogue around divisive issues using the tools of therapy. There's never an expectation to convince anybody of anything. There's never an expectation of debating anyone about and convincing the rightness of a particular position. But it is a, an, uh, an expectation of, can we sit and tell our stories? Mm -hmm. Does your story remind me of something that makes me a little more aware of the complexity of my story? Where are my uncertainties? You know, I am absolutely sure about this until when? And so it's that kind of engagement. I think that it's what RCT is all about, really. It's like this, this sort of growing um, with everybody having an opportunity to grow and everybody having an opportunity to influence each other. That doesn't mean we are without conviction, but it does mean that sometimes when we are holding on to conviction or holding on to a stance, we are holding on to our fears and our limitations. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I want to ask you to, to respond to one other passage that, again, I found um, incredibly powerful. You might be able to tell that I'm trying to also leave um, leave anybody who watches this with sort of some hope and some some direction to take. So the other one of the other pieces that really um, that really struck me was when you when you spoke about compassion, um, and this is actually in a section where you're talking about that film, The Best of Enemies, and you say compassion. And this for me is just it's like such a powerful extension of what you were saying about respect. Compassion does not require sameness or attraction. It is not compassion that requires another person to live by our terms. That is ego augmentation. Compassion does not require us to agree with, condone, or find another person's or our own behavior the least bit acceptable. If we can stand firmly in our own shoes, uphold our values and convictions, and still find that liminal space, a gentle open space that makes room for another person's becoming. Ah, uh, 
Yes. It's stuff. an aspiration. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's an aspiration. Um, and I, I think that is, you know, what I am thinking about, say, if I quote someone like um, Hanson, who says, you can keep people in your heart. You can become curious. You know, you can say, what is there uh, that this person needs to feel that she matters? How did that become? What's, what was the path that led to this space? Who am I to say that they'll never grow beyond that? I may choose how I want to engage or not engage, um, but I can respect that there is something in this person. If I think of some of the people, and I, it's so easy for me to do, to think of people whose behavior I think of as completely heinous. Um, I can also think, I wonder what would have become of me had I been trained in the same way. You know, there is a reason that people, we sometimes see people, if you, if you are living in a world, and this is what our culture does, our culture says everybody's got to be better than somebody. And if you aren't, then you're nothing. If you live with that kind of fear, then you might see some really um, outrageous positioning to like put, you know, put oneself a scaffold higher mm -hmm. and knowing that it, again, we get to choose how we will engage with that or not engage with that. But I do think we have to see it as a part of the human condition, the part of, a part of the human condition that we have been trained into, particularly um, in the United States. And I'm sure in other places too, I, 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 I shouldn't say in just the United States. What I am saying is that race has been a power over tool in the United States for us to find ways to uh, rank order human worth. Yeah, okay. Well, again, I feel like we could go on, but um, you've been so generous with your time. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about or anything else that you'd like to add? I, I think I would say that I just believe in the, the power of the human spirit when we decide to claim our power. When we decide that we can figure out how we want to live in a humane way in a very complex, divisive world, and also how we want to cultivate the kinds of allies we need in order to do that. Um, we, we can't do that if we surround ourselves, you know, like in an echo chamber. Uh, but, and we can find people who share our values, if not the ways we manifest those values. And I think creating that kind of community, I think it's the only way that we come to this place of um, just living in a, being more fully human really being more of who we are called to become while we are on the planet. Well, thank you so much, Maureen. I'm thank really you. I'm grateful that you would spend this time and I can't wait to share this with some students and with colleagues and friends. So thank you very much.